Question. How do you finish your fighting career at an all-time high? Is it by knocking out the 11th title challenger in the middleweight division during a title reign that lasted almost six years? Is it by losing the middleweight title to your longtime rival, but then capturing the light heavyweight title right after and beating three of its former divisional champions? Is it by beating the hardest hitter in your division in a closely contested fight, retiring for four years, then choking out the new champion for a division you've never even competed in? Oh, I know. It's by beating a former heavyweight champion who hasn't touched the octagon in three years, who was knocked out badly in his last outing, and is currently 42 years old. An age way past a UFC fighter's is prime. Stipe Miocic made his long-awaited heavyweight return after three years only to get knocked out by John Jones by a brutal spinning back kick to the body. And with this impressive performance, John Jones defends his heavyweight title for the first time, becoming one of four champions to defend his belt in two weight classes, and cements his legacy as the greatest mixed martial artist of all time. Or are there still some question marks around this fight? And what about just beyond this fight? What do some of the numbers say about Oliveira vs Chandler and the rest of the card behind UFC 309? In this video, we'll jump into the stats behind UFC 309 and some of the storylines that come after it. This video is brought to you by Cosmo Reverb, our first channel member. We had a great conversation on our member exclusive comment thread and had a special insight on my next video. I want to personally thank Cosmo Reverb for supporting my channel as they aid my transition to give more to it. If you want to become a channel member, click the join button on the channel page. You'll get a shout out in the next video and have access to exclusive perks. Thank you. I remember watching the main card of UFC 290 last year and thinking to myself, wow, the UFC really does save the best for last. Bo Nickel knocking out Val Woodburn in the first 40 seconds of the fight, getting a mini fight of the night when Dan Hooker and Jalen Turner threw down, only to be overshadowed by an even better five round fight between Brandon Moreno and Alexandre Pantoja. And of course, we can't forget about the two performance of the nights by Drikas and Alexander Volkanovsky. However, at UFC 309, it came as a surprise when two of the three performance bonuses didn't actually happen in the main card, but rather in the early prelims of the night. Oban Elliott defeats Basil Hafez by knockout in the first minute of the third round. And while the stats say he was winning quite comfortably as he was outstriking Basil for all three rounds, the judges' scorecards were kind of a mixed bag, and it actually could have came down to the third round had Oban Elliott not knocked him out. For Basil Hafez, this is a big setback. As not too long ago, he had a very close split decision loss to JDM, which, if he had won, could have seen him ranked in the top 15. In another bonus-worthy performance, Ramiz Brahimaj defeats Mickey Gall by a brutal right hook that folded Mickey to the canvas. Ramiz looked fearless out there and really wanted to test his boxing against a veteran of the fight game. But to prove he looked fearless, check out his significant strike output for all his fights in the UFC. Significant strike output normally correlates to fighter aggression. Ramiz had a pretty downward trend in this stat line in most of his UFC fights. But then, look at his stat line against Mickey Gall. Yeah. But not only was this the best aggression that Ramiz showed, he also scored his highest distance strike accuracy to this date too. Further on in the prelims, we saw Marcin Tabura beat Jonata Janiz by vicious grounded elbows. And when I mean vicious, it was pretty vicious. Marcin Tabura rallied after getting dropped early in the first round and put on his back but then proceeded to dominate the rest of the fight by controlling Janiz on the ground and securing probably the bloodiest TKO I've ever seen. But beyond that vicious TKO that Tabura secured, one thing really caught my eye when they were doing the fighter announcements. Did you know Marcin Tabura had the third most control time in UFC heavyweight history? And after yet another display of him imposing his will on a poor heavyweight, he surpasses one of the greatest in Cain Velasquez and becomes the number two UFC heavyweight with the most control time. Remarkable. Speaking of breaking records, Jim Miller is still breaking them at 41 years old. 
and he's still winning. Jim Miller beat Damon Jackson by a jumping Armin guillotine choke. And at his old age and ending another one of his fights on a high note, you might wonder if that was it for him, if he should retire. But instead, he retired Damon Jackson. After this win, Jim Miller extends his UFC fighter record to from 44 to 45 appearances, extends his UFC wins from 26 to 27, and funnily enough, extends his submission attempts record from 48 to 49. He already holds all of these records in the UFC. He's just extending his lead. Do you ever feel like sometimes stats lie? That sometimes you look at a fight and you know who clearly won, but the stats disagree? Well, let me introduce you to the first fight of the main card. Mauricio Rufi beats James Yontop by a unanimous decision, 29-28, and could arguably have been a 30-27. But if you look at the UFC stats database and check the general overview of this fight, you'll notice that even though Rufi won, he was outlanded by over 23 significant strikes. So, how did Rufi win? Well, we know the damage from Saul with the new unified rules of MMA, and that the most damaging strikes a fighter can land are to the head. So with that context, here's a chart of Mauricio Rufi's significant head strike differential per round against James Yontop. From the chart, you can see that Rufi outlanded Yontop to the head in every single round. So were the stats wrong? No. But you do have to look at it in context. And then we get to the co-main event. After waiting for over two years with the hope of getting that red panty night with Conor McGregor, Michael Chandler returned to the octagon to face Charles Oliveira in a rematch from their first encounter in 2021. Unfortunately, he couldn't get his revenge though. Unlike their first fight in which Michael Chandler almost became the UFC lightweight champion, this fight was mostly an Oliveira show. Charles Oliveira outstruck Michael Chandler for four rounds on the feet with his very improved boxing and Muay Thai, and also had him in heavy control time during the fight. The fight of the night consisted of the most strikes accumulated and the most combined control time between two fighters at UFC 309. For Charles, this was the first five round decision he's ever had in his professional career. The most significant strikes he's landed in a fight and the most he's had an opponent under control time. Yeah, I've been hearing talks of this being the best Charles Oliveira we've ever seen, but I would be very skeptical about pushing this narrative. So why? Here's a chart of Charles Oliveira's distance strike defense over the course of his UFC career. As you can see, Charles Oliveira's distance strike defense has actually been trending downward for the past few years and his fight against Michael Chandler was one of his worst displays of it. Although Charles is a great offensive fighter, he still lacks the great defense that would beat Islam and capture UFC gold again. As for Michael Chandler, this was the second worst defensive performance ever in his UFC run. The only other person to get his numbers this bad was Charles Oliveira. And then we get to the main event. John Jones defeats former champion Stipe Miocic by a brutal spinning back kick. This was the first time we've seen Stipe in over three years since losing to Francis Ngannou. And oh boy, it did not look good. When you're fighting the greatest fighter of all time, there's some expectation that your stat lines will get messed up. But couple that with the long layoff and the fact that you're 42 years old now, and it's a recipe for disaster. In fact, this was Stipe's worst performance in his career, by any stat line. The most time he's been under control, the worst significant head strike accuracy, the worst head strike defense. This was really hard to watch if you're a Stipe fan. But if you're a John Jones fan, you're rejoicing. John Jones looked great out there. He was getting the better of the striking exchanges against Stipe, tripped him and brutalized him on the takedown. And if you look at the stat lines, John Jones might have had his best striking performance. Here's a chart of John Jones' distance strike accuracy over the course of his UFC run. As you can see, this was Jones' best distance strike accuracy in his UFC career. And despite him now being 37 years old, 
his strike accuracy has surprisingly been trending upward as he's been fighting for longer. But is this performance legit? After fighting a former legend of the sport in Stipe after a three year layoff, there are still a lot of question marks surrounding John Jones's final stamp to his fighting career. Has John Jones done enough for his legacy? Or should he fight Tom Aspinall to fully secure it? Personally, I think John Jones has done enough in his fighting career. He doesn't need to fight Tom Aspinall to prove it more. Was his fight against Stipe underwhelming? Absolutely. But if he were to retire right now, there would still be no question. John Jones is the best fighter in the world. And so UFC 309 enters the history books. From Oban Elliott's comeback knockout to secure a performance bonus, to Charles Oliveira's relentless dominance of Michael Chandler that saw many highs and lows for each fighter's stat lines, the night was meant to break records. But at the center of it all, John Jones's brilliant finish of former champion Stipe Miocic left us with a question as big as his legacy itself. Was this the final chapter? On paper, it's the perfect ending. A devastating win, another record-breaking performance, and a legacy that's hard to challenge. Yet, for some fight fans, the fight feels incomplete. It's a battle won against a legend whose best days are already past. Should John Jones risk it all to face Tom Aspinall, the young lion of the division? Or has he already done more than enough to claim the title of the greatest? In the post-fight interview, John Jones opened up the possibility of continuing to fight after his win against Stipe. And although he can walk away right now as the GOAT, the hype of one final dance would be even bigger than this. Fighting Tom Aspinall wouldn't just be about defending a title. It would be about silencing every doubt, proving that even against a prime, dynamic heavyweight, that John Jones remains untouchable. Any additional graphs will be available in the community post. If you like the content, then consider subscribing, liking or sharing the video, and leave a comment down below for discussion. Thanks for watching everyone, and to our channel members, especially Cosmo Reverb, thank you for keeping the lights on. I'll see you in the next one.